Thank you for joining us, everyone, and a big welcome back to the G2Z online event series. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name's Nell Thompson and I'm the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero, or as we call it, G2Z program. I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. Getting to Zero was developed by the Animal Welfare League of Queensland and they continue to support it to this day. G2Z offers its consulting, support and educational services at no charge to local governments and not-for-profits across Australia. Our focus continues to be on companion animal welfare and management issues such as strategy, legislation, operations, programs and community engagement working towards reducing intake into pounds and shelters and keeping pets in their homes. We invite people to look at our website at g2z.org.au, yeah. sign up for our regular e-news, connect with us via social media and get in touch with us to see if we can help or just have a chat about the issues that you're facing in your community or your organisation. So to today's session, we've had lots of interest in it, which is fantastic, and I'm really keen to learn a lot because I do not know a lot about this topic. Once I hand over to our presenter, there'll be around 50 minutes of presentation time and around 10 minutes, 15 minutes of question time once the presentation's concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website to everyone to watch at any time in a day or so. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation unless our presenter indicates otherwise. And if you have questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you have very quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, Please put your hand up. There's a bottom a button at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to them during the presentation. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through and the occasional cat that passes across the screen. I'm very happy to introduce Erin Williams today. Erin's been involved in dog behaviour and training for 30 odd years and through her business Beyond Dog Training, she deals with everything from puppies to anxious and aggressive dogs and often works alongside behaviour vets. Erin's other passion has been in, in the Livestock Guardian, or as we're going to call them, LGD field, particularly in the USA where she's highly respected. She's brought that knowledge, experience and understanding to Australia via her business, Livestock Guardian Dogs Australia. She educates industry colleagues in assisting suburban LGDs and also farmers in establishing successful LDG, LGD strategies to prevent livestock predation. Her work has seen her recognised as a finalist for the 2022 New South Wales ACT AgriFutures Rural Women's Award and the 2023 Hunter Region Business Excellence Awards. Her LGD webinar is part of Michael Shikagio's Aggression in Dogs Master Course. And if you haven't done that, I recommend that you do. Erin is a member of the Delta Institute Expert Advisory Committee and the Assistance Animals Committee. So over to you, Erin. Thanks very much, Nell. And uh, thank you all for coming. Um, really appreciate your interest in this topic, which to us is very important as well. And um, it's great for us to know that you're, you'll have this understanding to take back to your shelters, pounds and rescues. So thank you very much. So let's move on without any further ado. Um, I will mention, though, that I have invited Robin Jenkins today. Robin's very much immersed in the Marema rescue field in North Queensland. She's very well known, very uh, experienced and capable, and um, you'll hear from Robin throughout the presentation as well. And her contact details are in the slides. Thanks, Erin. Uh, just the heading for this presentation and the image on the right is very typical of what you'll see with these livestock guardian dogs. They're the breeds that are going to very quickly go into learned helplessness or shut down because they don't deal very well with typical uh, environments in shelters and rescues, uh, sorry, pounds. 
Uh, just a note about copyright. Please remember that this is the intellectual property of, us, of Livestock Guardian Dogs Australia and affiliated contacts. So please, no copying of the material. We're more than happy to help anybody out. So there's no need to copy it. Just get in touch with us. So the, some of the content that we're going to look at today is what is a livestock guardian dog, an overview of the breeds and their purpose, the typical behaviours that you'll see of the breeds, how they're different or how they're similar to other dogs, how best to respond to them or win them over, why they may be surrendered and not claimed, specific needs whilst in your care, and the best placement opportunities for LGDs because that will help you in your role as adopting these dogs out. Um, so this is a typical image from Europe. This is actually in Romania, and there's five livestock guardian dogs in that image, and you can see how well they blend in with their environment. So sometimes the coat is a selected uh, characteristic of some breeds, and there's a little tiny herding dog there too who's very cute. So, uh, so they're purpose-bred to protect livestock and property and have been for over 3,000 years. It's, it's termed a non-lethal predator-friendly control method because unlike in Australia, we're not, they're not using baits, trapping or shooting because they don't have to because this strategy is very successful when it's done properly. They're independent thinking and highly intelligent dogs. They have a low prey drive. Uh, they do not herd it. Sorry about that. They have physical and behavioural variations, which makes them very resilient and quicker to use aggression. Strong instinctive behaviours to guard and protect and a propensity to fight a threat rather than to flee from it. These are your typical breeds that you'll see in Australia, the Maremma or the Maramana Abruzzi, because that's the region that that breed comes from originally in Italy. And on the right is your Anatolian Shepherd or your Kangal, which originated around the Turkish region. Some of the physical characteristics of the breeds are they generally have a large frame with a large skull and, of course, large canine teeth. And you can see that in that middle image, how big the canines are. Powerful musculature. So, and also their neck and their jaw, and that's for fighting. Floppy ears. People say that they have floppy ears so they blend in and the sheep aren't afraid of them because foxes, wolves, etc., have pointy ears. Double coated, which means that they're very well insulated in the cold and in the heat. They have a lot of loose skin for fighting, particularly around the dewlap, which is around the throat area, and that's so that a predator can't get a hold of their trachea and their other vital organs in that region. Some of them are polydactyl, which means they have the double dew claw on the rear leg, which is that image on the bottom left. They also generally have a lower metabolism. There's individuals that, that are a bit different, but generally they don't eat a lot, particularly if they're spending most of their time resting. And just a brief history of livestock guardian dogs. So these are the countries in which they originated, Europe, the Balkans, Central Asia, Caucasus and Russia, and in the Middle East. They are often referred to as a primitive breed. So you have your purebred breed, but you also have your land race. Now, land race is when, uh, particularly in Europe and those other regions where there's a lot of peasant farming, peasant yeah. farmers will um, cross their dogs with other dogs that they like characteristics of. So then you don't find generally a lot of real purebreds in those, in those situations. Now, transhumans is a, a term that's often linked with livestock guardians in those countries, and it's the seasonal movement of livestock between grazing areas. And in Europe, they are allowed to graze their livestock in national parks. As a result, they're subject to all of the predators in Europe, which can be bears, wolves, etc. So they often need a lot of dogs. Uh, they'll, the shepherd remains with the stock, and you can see there in that bottom picture on the right, uh, that's a typical sleeping hut for a shepherd out in the field. And you can see in the background there, there's two of his dogs and the sheep are further beyond those dogs. So the shepherds remain with their, with their flocks and herds and back up their guardian dogs. So this is where the term partnership comes in when you hear us talking about livestock guardian dogs. Uh, juveniles learn on the job. So puppies are raised in the village 
and the juveniles go out with the older dogs into the forest or wherever to learn on the job and generally the older dogs take care of it as opposed to our western style of agriculture where it's incumbent on the farmer to train that those dogs if they don't have an adult dog to train the younger ones and that's where we can get into a bit of trouble cultural difference in socialization training and welfare standards quite a marked difference between their welfare standards and our welfare standards so they have diverse roles and you can see here each of those images displays their diverse roles it's not uncommon for these dogs to be used as babysitters particularly in those european countries and they are very very good at it these dogs would never ever harm a human child um, they're totally reliable very good with children carrying packs and you can see also the carting that's during world war one very common for these dogs to be used for that and also they're just general property or farm protection guardians this is the list of the traditional predators that these dogs have to deal with and you can see it's quite extensive it ranges from your large animals bears large cats uh, wolves etc right around to your birds of prey domestic dogs and cats, and rustlers. They're very good at preventing a livestock from being stolen. So what distinguishes an LGD from other breeds? They dig a lot of big holes, and you can see on the left there, there's actually another dog already in that hole, and there were lots of cabins underneath there. So that's the extent of their hole digging. Play can be very rough, a lot of body slamming. They're independent thinking, and so they're not as biddable as some of your other breeds that want to work closely with humans. These dogs were bred to be able to make decisions on their own in the paddock. Most are not friendly to strange dogs, and this is why we have a bit of reactivity when people take them out walking once they're adults. They are less tolerant of breaches of body language rules, and what I mean by that is, you know, your normal companion dogs they're going to forgive you for doing something like that they're, they're not going to be um, startled by that whereas a livestock guardian dog will so your body language has to be very careful and very considered when you're around them just so that there's no misunderstandings they have a quicker response to perceived threats so they're a bit like they'll shoot first and ask questions later and that's because predation is normally very quiet and very quick so these dogs must be very quick in their responses to protect their livestock. They're quick to lose focus in repetitive requests. An example might be they're in a training class and you're asking them to do something three times. They'll do it once. You might get a second one, but you can forget the third one. They're bred with a low prey drive, we talked about. They have an acute focus on the environment because the environment is where they get all their information. When they're separated or from their bonded family, so it can be a human family or their livestock, this can cause them great distress. Lots of nocturnal barking, and we'll be focusing on that later on. How are they like other breeds? This is my um, Marema, who came out of a paddock. She was abandoned, and I found her and transformed her into a Delta therapy dog, and she would go into nursing homes. She had a fantastic temperament fantastically socialized never had an issue with her and you can see that they can also be very much like other breeds so very sensitive and gentle motiv motivated by what they find rewarding positive reinforcement reinforcement is the most effective and it's an absolute must you cannot use force on these dogs some are responsive to high value treats. You know, lots of people say my livestock guardian dog won't take treats. If you increase the value, you'll generally find that they will. Fantastic achievements in dog sports, such as nose work, tracking, obedience, lure coursing, therapy and service dogs. And we'll be looking at a couple of those later. They enjoy the company of other species. So if you've got cats or rabbits, they will protect them. They are extremely loyal. Some are friendly with other dogs. Some are friendly to human strangers on and off the property. This dog was. They still need socialisation. Fear-free husbandry is an absolute must at any veterinary clinic. Uh, training they need and enrichment and very good management. 
So just to give you an understanding of how they guard and how that's developed so that you'll see some of these characteristics when they're with you in the kennels, uh, in your yards, etc. So they have a late maturation, which means they don't really mature into an adult until they're four years of age. We never leave them with livestock before the age of two years. There are some dogs that you can, but they're generally a juvenile until they're two years of age. They have a diversity in their guarding style. So some will want to pursue predators. Some will want to stay with the livestock. They generally stay with their livestock 24-7. They like high vantage points. And you can see here this dog is, is checking everything out from a high vantage point. You'll see them sitting on rocks, on bales of hay, etc., just so they've got a bit of a vantage. Some will try to expand their territory. So it's super important that you have a physical fence Sport fences and invisible fences are not enough. These dogs will bust through those fences. They won't come back because they don't want to take a second shock and then you've lost your dog. You cannot have these dogs without proper fencing. And in fact, whenever anybody consults with me who's thinking about having a dog, I say to them that I can't work with them unless they have an adequate fence. And we're talking about five foot. Sometimes they're successful at repurposing. So we've successfully repurposed some suburban livestock guardian dogs to working situations, but that's mm -hmm. only because they were in the proper hands. You just can't throw them out into the paddock and expect them to make that jump. Some of them don't because they've been in suburbia for too long. And Robin will be very good at talking about that if you've got more questions about it. Uh, so they're referred to as nocturnal, which means they're most active at night, and that's because most of your predators are active at night. But predators are also ac ac active at twilight, which is your dusk and your dawn, so we do refer to them as crepuscular as well. So this is just an indication of what they're like when they're working and not under threat. So they love to be outside. And you can see that image down on the bottom left. You can see how good the coat is. That dog's asleep in the snow. They will always choose to be outside. If it's snowing or it's frost, even better. They love the cold. If you've got a dog inside in, with an open fireplace, they're going to be very uncomfortable. So give them the option to go inside or out. And the colder, the better. Really important. That's your choice. They're calm, docile, gentle, and sensitive. They rarely use a kennel. Affectionate and nurturing. And you can see on the left there that Marama's actually suckling a couple of kids, goat kids. They're extremely loyal. They're aloof and observant. Inquisitive of visitors. Checking their territory, scenting, and marking is absolutely important to them. That's what they do. This is a great video from one of my local clients, and this is Win Winston, and he's indicating on a fox. And what this video will show you is how good their eyesight is and how good their air scenting is. Now, no doubt Winston picked up this fox via air scenting first before he spotted him, or he might have spotted him first, but generally it's via air scenting. Can you all hear that? Yeah, I'm not getting any volume. Just let me see. I just, I think I might have to tell it. Okay, I'll play it anyway. Uh, if you can just imagine that that dog is barking, there's something, re there's a reason why it's not coming through. You can just imagine that dog is barking uh, and the owner is trying to find the fox and you can see how difficult it is. So this dog is running back and forth and barking at this fox up and down that fence. You can just see it there to the right of the tree. There it is. It's just moving. So it's moving again. So Winston's anim animated again. He's barking. And that's normal. That's really good. That's what we want to see. He's actually telling the fox, don't come over here. I'm going to come and get you. So if that dog got out of that enclosure, that dog would be on that fox very, very quickly. These dogs can move very, very quickly. 
So the owner has just praised that dog and you can see what that dog's done. He sat down because the owner connected with that dog and praised him. So that dog feels great because the owner's picked up on the fact that he's doing his job. This is a great partnership. And so the fox is now on the other side of the tree, just moving through those tussocks. And see how difficult it is to see them? This is how good they are. And uh, at the end, um, the owner says, um, good boy, Winnie, he's moving away. And the little child says, is he moving away because of Winston? That's right. So, so I'm sorry about the audio there, but um, you can see how they operate on a, you know, when they're working. So when they're not working and they were away from their property, they're not in their working mode. So you're going to get a, a different set of behaviours. Trusting partnership is absolutely vital here. They're going to be relying on you to make those decisions that they would normally make in the paddock. So if you don't make the, the right decisions and they feel threatened, they're going to jump in. So really important that you're conscious of what's going on for them, what stress they're under outside of their own environment. They're very focused on the environment and people. A loose LGD will never approach or attack unprovoked. It's really important that you know that. They are the same as any other dog. They're probably even more scared than other dogs. They're more tolerant of other people and dogs when they're off their property. And that image on the bottom left, that's Layla. She's a great Pyrenees. And she was the only dog that this German Shepherd would play with. They are very confident dogs, so in whether it's in play or handling other dogs. And this is juveniles, puppies to juveniles. So that just shows you how confident they are. On the right there, we were introducing a second dog onto this property. You always introduce with a barrier between you. You'd never bring a new dog onto that livestock guardian dog's property. It's too dangerous. And how they're approached is key, particularly when they're out in public. So LGDs and resource guarding, absolutely important that we talk about this. It's a Resource guarding is a natural behaviour for survival. It's what you see around a bone. So you approach your dog after you've given it a bone and you get a growl and a, probably hovering over the bone. That dog's telling you, don't come near me. I don't come near my resource. And anecdotally, totally, resource guarding is very prevalent in livestock guardian dogs. The extent, range and intensity can differ between individuals. It can be a learned behaviour, for example, the result of experiences as a puppy competing for food. We like to encourage breeders to feed their pups separately. It can develop in other areas too, so it can expand into things such as spaces, people, doorways, gates, beds, pets and toys. Very common for these dogs to uh, be very guarding of spaces and people. And as any other breed, it manifests in the same way as avoidance, so they'll flee with the resource, threats, they'll freeze over the resource, lunging, lip curl, baring the teeth, growling, barking. If you don't move away or stop your approach, they'll then escalate to things like a muzzle punch, snapping, biting, attacking if you don't move away. So be very careful about resource guarding around livestock guardian dogs. So what can elicit uh, aggression or reactivity outside of the working situation, stress and fear, bad breeding, lack of socialisation and social skills, breaches of body language rules, resource guarding, use of force, aversives and abuse, high arousal. So, for example, you know, your dog's really aroused because something is going on and you reach out to grab its collar, you're going to get redirected aggression lack of choice so if they can't use flight and they feel cornered they'll use fight same as any other dog lack of space particularly in multi-dog households distrust or concern about strangers children play fighting and visitors particularly their body language now the thing with children play fighting if you've got children and you've got a group of children coming over or one other child coming over to play with your kids put your livestock guardian dog away somewhere safe give them something to do whilst those children are there because they can mistake the screaming and the running and the tripping over and the wrestling and everything as your children are going to be harmed. So just be aware of that. 
and also if used for dog baiting, uh, they can uh, have a propensity to the wrong aggression. Common stresses for livestock guardian dogs, and we all know that stress prevents any animal from learning, and it also can cause a large percentage of reactivity or aggression. So how stress can occur for these dogs is critical failures in management, not understanding their needs uh, and their body language needs, lack of space or the absence of choice to move away, confinement and separation, other stressed animals around them. So because they're really focused on other animals, if other animals are stressed, that's going to up their stress because they feel like they should be protecting them. Our visitors, barrier frustration, again, unfamiliar surroundings, strangers patting them on walks. We do not need people patting these dogs on walks. We also don't need to take them to dog parks. And you can get away with it as a, a puppy or a juvenile, but once they become adults, they start to want to guard. And also the use of coercion, force or aversives or repeated abuse. They're not as forgiving as your normal breeds are and anxiety. And here's an example of what can happen in a daycare, for example, this Pyrenees uh, in America, um, he would go to this daycare and eventually what happened was he started to claim that space. So those other dogs became his livestock or his family that he needed to guard. There he is on the highest point in the yard guarding. So what happened was some tradies came and had to do some work there and they needed to get to the other side of the yard and this dog would not let them come through the yard so they had to keep going around the perimeter to get to their other point. So it's just a funny example of how these dogs can surprise us with what they will guard. So what do they need? They need a job to do, an understanding of their motivations. I'll put all of that on so you can read it at leisure good management, including of their environment. When we are training these dogs in a working situation, what we want to do is we want to set up the environment so that we're nurturing that guarding instinct. Then we bring in a little bit of training and it's showing them what we want them to do. You know, we don't want you to chase the livestock and play with them. We want you to sit over here and be quiet. Just watch. Uh, enrichment based on LGD motivations. Puppies do like playing with toys, you know, and there's nothing wrong with livestock guardian dogs having toys. Positive reinforcement training is important, socialisation. There's your fear-free protocols once again. Absolutely important that all veterinary clinics get on board with it. Choice and agency to meet, retreat, stay outside in the cold. Space and separate quiet kennel areas, super important in your shelters and your pounds. They don't need to meet other dogs or go to the dog park. And it can take weeks for them to settle in more so than your other dogs. So making quick assessments on these dogs isn't recommended. Delaying your assessments until the dogs have had a time to acclimatise and settle in is, is much more uh, beneficial. So rewarding opportunities to incorporate into your enrichment programs can include things such as protection roles of family or pets, opportunities to explore because that's what they're doing all the time. Patrolling, scenting and marking is super important to them. Acknowledging their barking alerts. So this is where the partnership comes in. If you're inside on the couch and your dog's outside barking, he's telling you, hey, there's something out here you need to come and sit, have a look at. And if you just yell out from the, from the couch, shut up, you know, which most of us tend to do and not get up off the couch, it's not going to work. You have to get up, open that door and say, thank you very much, Maya, and here's a treat, or thank you very much, I'll take care of this. And the dogs will then go and sit down. They want you to do your side of the partnership, which is acknowledging and working with them. So there's your praise. Time with their charges is important. Digging, hiking, climbing, swimming are all really important sports to these dogs or activities that they enjoy, having choice, therapy roles, and then there's all your dog sports. We're going to look at some of those dog sports coming up. So here's um, Rath, I think it is, sorry. I'm just trying to move this panel. So this is Rath competing in dock diving. As I said, they love their swimming. This is Yeti on the left competing in what's called Fast Cat. Fast Cat is a shortened version of lure coursing and these dogs are very, very fast. 
That's Liberty on the right competing in music freestyle. And these are Polish Tatras on the top left uh, used for karting. This is an old photo. And on the bottom left there, that's Francis Crane, who established the first Great Pyrenees Kennel in the USA. Uh, just to clarify, they call them Great Pyrenees in the US and in Australia we call them the Pyrenean Mountain Dog. On the top right there is Knucklehead. That's his affectionate name, doing obedience and agility. And he's an award-winning dog. So you can get these dogs to do sports. You just have to have the right approach. And this is Luria. Luria is actually a working dog and she comes out of the paddock and she competes in confirmation and drafting. So there's your versatility. These dogs are very versatile. And this is Maya. Uh, this is a colleague of mine in the US. And Maya is the first Great Pyrenees, excuse me, to earn the National Association of Canine Scent Work. Absolutely fabulous. So just some recommendations. Clinical care, rescue, shelters, fostering. Um, adopters need to do their homework. Make sure that they know what they're taking on. Fear-free protocols are absolutely necessary for husbandry and grooming. So they need to find a groomer who's going to use fear-free protocols and they need to find a vet who's going to do that as well. Slow approaches, careful human body language. Multi-dog households, watch for your resource guarding. It's, it's about the space. People are in the kitchen preparing food, whether it's a dog food or human food. If you've got a livestock guardian dog in there and there's tight spaces, then there's going to be problems. You know, dogs use space to defuse tension. If we don't provide that space for them, they can't defuse the tension and we're pushing them into arguing and fighting and reacting. Um, move the dog away from an empty bowl before you pick it up. If you've got one of these in a shelter or a pound, do not reach down, pick up that food bowl. Move the dog out of the kennel or behind a barrier before you touch that bowl. Alternatively, kick it out of the door, but just be very careful. Because even though the, you might think the bowl is empty, if there's a scary food in there and you've interrupted the dog eating it, or the dog's just moved away because it's gonna come back to it later, you could get into a bit of trouble. And do not ever startle a sleeping or a drugged livestock guardian dog. Um, that, that doesn't go very well. They will launch first. So it's a startle effect. It can happen with other dogs, but particularly with these dogs. Uh, so this is an example of a veterinary visit. Jessica Fritchie is a very well-known uh, trainer in the US. Uh, and this is, she related to me what they did with this livestock guardian dog when it came in for some procedures. And as you can see, we went very slow. We read his body language. We gave lots of breaks. We used a basket model, muzzle. And the owner is the one who fed that dog the food. Um, and you can see that it was successful. So what can happen in suburbia? Often these dogs are confined in backyards or apartments, so there's a lack of exercise, no job. Absence of family to protect, so that causes stress for them. Lack of self-rewarding opportunities, things that livestock guardian dogs would find rewarding in a working situation. Lack of space lack of owner education and understanding, unrealistic expectations by owners, and you'll see that in a list coming up of why they end up in shelters, bad reputation for essentially normal livestock guardian dog behaviours, high surrender rates, and some breed prejudice. So 75% of surrenders at a livestock guardian dog sanctuary in the USA were aggression cases or bite cases. Only two have rebitten in that environment because they're with somebody who understands their needs. One of those was to an un, un, unidentified trigger and one was to a known trigger. So other reasons for surrender of livestock guardian dogs. And you can see here that typical behaviours that you're going to see them coming into shelters, barking, aggression, social skills, couldn't take it to the dog park. If they did their research, they would have found out that you can't, you, you wouldn't expect to take them to a dog park as an adult. Destructive digging, escaping, normal behaviours. Stubborn, won't obey. These dogs aren't stubborn, they're misunderstood. 
I'm longing for the day that we never use the word stubborn ever again in relation to a livestock guardian dog because it's highly inappropriate. Too big, didn't know it would get that big because they fall in love with the cute white fluffy puppy. They live in an apartment or townhouse. There's lots of shedding with these dogs as well and some drooling. And there is a propensity for physical ACL injuries, hip dysplasia, cancer, particularly because we've got a lot of backyard breeding going on now. And neglect, abandonment and hoarding, of course. So your approach to an LGD is very important. They're very insensitive. They're very sensitive. They are unforgiving of harsh treatment. They're not stubborn. They just have different needs. They're generally an aloof breed. So individual variations can exist. Building trust, predictability and kindness with them is your key in when you've got them in your environments. So they don't do very well in these environments. Uh, and they're often, um, when they're being assessed, uh, often the assessor's not aware of their normal lifestyle guardian dog behaviours and not making allowances for it. So there's your aloofness, lack of response to requests. They're not biddable like other dogs. They're intolerant of unknown dogs and people, and they're quicker to respond to breaches of body language. So super important that we're aware of those characteristics with those dogs, when you're particularly when you're making an assessment. So now just moving into the actual shelters, uh, environments, etc. So your context is very important when you're approaching these dogs. For example, you're a ranger and you're entering a livestock guardian dog's territory and the owner is absent. Don't do it. Wait until the owner is home versus trying to capture a loose livestock guardian dog. So the first dog, when you're approaching his territory and the owner's not there, he's a very confident dog. He's not going to let you in. Whereas in the second environment, the dog's loose, he's scared, he's frightened. Your approach there needs to be very, very careful. So it's really important that you contact an experienced livestock guardian dog rescue group for help with approaching a loose livestock guardian dog. Uh, these groups have had lots of success with locating and recapturing roaming livestock guardian dogs. And approaches to livestock guardian dogs in uh, when they're loose, etc., by the public is not recommended at all because it can actually make the situation worse and push these dogs further into hiding. What do they need whilst in your care? So they need no expectations. Just be very slow and very careful with them. Give them time and space to decompress the housing. So find a quiet, low stimulus area for them uh, and somewhere they can retreat within that kennel if you can. Uh, your approach, so use a low sitting voice, deliver movements and refrain from lifting your arms quickly. Do not reach for the food bowls. We've talked about that. And the routine, keep it structured and predictable for these dogs. You know, all dogs like routine and like things to be predictable, these dogs even more so. And see if you can have a familiar carer approaching them rather than different people all the time. If you can't, maybe you could do two or three people that that's their job to work with that dog. Activity, limit your interactions to feeding, watering for at least the first 24 hours. Uh, they do not need to meet or socialise with other dogs. Did you have something to say, Robin? Um, no, I think that wraps it up pretty well. Um, but that being able to give them that space to decompress, um, I'd really like to stress how important that is for them in a shelter or pound situation. Um, they really do need time. You've mentioned how focused they are on their environment. They need to reach that conclusion themselves that they're in that they are somewhere safe. And leaving them to get on with it by themselves is definitely the way to go. Yeah, that's really important. Thanks for that. Um, what is the best way to manage them and respond to them when they're in the environment? So um, really important that you understand that a lot of working livestock guardian dogs will not be microchipped. You may find some suburban ones that aren't as well, but don't be surprised by that. Uh, most livestock guardian dogs who are in working situations are also not socialised. People just chuck them in the paddock with the livestock, expect them to do their job. 
that's another issue, but they don't um, socialise them because they don't think that there's a need to. So those dogs haven't been in a car, they've never been on a leash, never been crated, never been with other dogs, never been with other people. That's why you're going to see a lot of reactivity on them when they're caught. So seek guidance from an experienced LGD trainer, myself, or rescuers such as Robin. Reach out if you need help. We are more than happy to help you. Please don't hesitate. We want to see you succeed with these dogs as much as uh, we want to succeed as well. And please don't rely on people who tend to use heavy-handed tactics. There are some practitioners out there. I call practitioners experienced farmers, you know, who are using these dogs. Some of them use very heavy-handed tactics. We don't want to go there. We want to, we want to approach it from a positive reinforcement uh, approach. Fast track them to an LGD specialising rescue and fosters. Working dogs are unlikely to be leash or crate trained. We talked about common to refuse food in unfamiliar surroundings too. So if there's no signs of illness, just keep offering small amounts regularly. And hand feeding, which is human hand to a dog's mouth, is absolutely not advised nor necessary. Please do not do it. It's just the wrong breeds to do that too. And, in fact, you wouldn't do that with any dog that's scared in a stressful situation anyway. So why are they surrendered and on the rehoming circuit so often? Inappropriate homes, such as your apartments, high-density dwellings, novice owners, unrealistic expectations of the owners who are uneducated about livestock guardian dogs. That's a big one. Normal instinctive behaviours are misunderstood by the owners who try to correct them as well. So the dogs are barking. That's their job. That's what's that's what's in their genes. So you have to manage them. If you've got a livestock guardian dog in a backyard in suburbia, you bring that dog in at night. You don't leave it outside. Simple, simple management. Barking, especially in suburbia, leads to the use of punishment such as shock collars. This creates even more issues because then the dog's feeling frustrated. It's resulting in redirected aggression to other pets and to the owners. So aggression, high propensity for resource guarding, which is misunderstood, so keep an eye on that, and your unethical breeding. Here's some examples of unethical breeding and what goes on. So you've got an absence of health testing uh, for your hip displays, your ACLs, other genetic issues, and we've got a lot of this happening now because they're being backyard bred. You know, all of the gum tree dogs, backyard bred. Incorrect temperament, once again, you know, good breeders will cull for the incorrect temperament, whereas gum tree, your backyard breeding, they don't care. They're just breeding anything. Livestock guardian dog mixing of the breed. So we've got lots of Maremas cross border collies, Maremas cross German shepherds, Maremas cross golden retrievers, and this is a big mistake. You know, crossing a guarding dog, livestock guardian dog with a herding dog such as the border collie, it creates internal conflict for that dog. I don't want to herd, but I do want to herd. Don't want to herd, don't I do want to herd. Um, also, your golden retrievers, we've already got a prevalence of resource guarding in golden retrievers, and we don't want to be making it worse by crossing those two kinds of breeds. And, you know, these people are making unfounded claims to people, you know, oh, you've got a dog that'll be able to herd and guard, and people who are novices, they fall for it. Did and you have anything so to say? It so does not work that way. Um, I know it sounds like it should, but it absolutely does not. When you breed a, a low prey drive dog like an LGD with a really high prey drive dog like a Border Collie or your cattle dogs, those sorts of things, what you end up with, instead of a dog that's good at both, you'll end up with a dog that's too high prey drive, too high prey drive to do livestock guardian dog work and too low prey drive to be a herding dog. So they're not really going to be good at either of those things. They'll be somewhere in the middle and feeling very frustrated because they're trying to follow two very different, almost polar opposite instincts. Perfect, Robin. That was very well explained. Thank you. So the outlook in Australia, Australia is expected to follow the same pattern in America of abandoned, surrendered and lost LGDs and those numbers over there are in their thousands. So it's coming to a continent near us. <laughs> in working situations, an understanding of and respect for the welfare of these dogs is often overshadowed by owners viewing them as a tool rather than a living being in with needs. 
You will see this in a lot of the working situations. It's something we're trying to address. It's part of the reason I established my business. I'm trying to address this so that we get the welfare in there, particularly for your working dogs. And the Australian movie Oddball did not do us any favours by popularising the Maremma, just like it didn't for the Collies when Lassie came out or Dalmatians when 101 Dalmatians came out. Um, this is this is a meme that goes around in our circles because it's absolutely accurate. So you get the nice little cute fluffy puppy that everybody falls in love with and then as soon as you hit the four month to six month mark right up until two years you've got a tyrannosaurus rex on your hands so um it's quite a funny meme for us and it's accurate and this is what throws a lot of novice owners out as well is they're not expecting it and why do they escape and get out inadequate fencing this is one of the reasons why I can't work with people if they don't have adequate fencing. It is doomed to failure right from the very beginning. You must have a physical fence of appropriate height. You also have to watch for these dogs climbing, jumping over and digging. So fortifying both ends of the those pickets is really important as well. I love this meme of Dorothy. So all of Dorothy's troubles could have been avoided if she had just put Toto on a leash. So when you're out and about with your livestock guardian dog, do not take that lead off. You will lose your dog. So what are the reasons they escape and wander off and get lost out of the paddock, for example, or out of their home? So sometimes it can be because they've previously got out and they're wanting to check those boundaries again. Uh, they might want to expand their territory. So if you think about these dogs, for example, a castle. So if you're in a castle and the enemy's coming, you want to know where the enemy is, particularly if you've got uh, bushland around your castle. So what would you do? You'd send a scout out and the scout would know what was going on, where the enemy was, and perhaps the scout might lead a, leave a bomb or something there. So what that dog's doing is he's going out and expanding his territory, laying his scent in a bigger perimeter outside his physical boundary. This is one of the most misunderstood about livestock guardian dogs. You can get a call from a farmer saying, oh, my neighbour's livestock guardian dog is chasing my cattle. Well, the reason for that is, one, that livestock guardian dog could get out of its own home and it resents the fact that the neighbour's cattle are right on his boundary. That livestock guardian dog is not chasing the cattle to hurt them. He's pushing them away. This is the most misunderstood in rural areas. That dog is trying to keep things away from his boundary. He's protecting his own livestock. That's all. He's not attempting to kill the cattle. When they're not bonded to their livestock or their family and they don't have a job, they're going to wander because they're bored. They need something. They're natural escape artists. Um, when sent to a new home, this is really prevalent. When they're sent to a new home, they're often not secured right away and they will escape within the first 24 to 48 hours. This is the most difficult to recapture. And I don't know how many dogs we've had in this situation. We've just had one recently and luckily they were able to catch it. Um, but very, very common, isn't it, Robin? Uh, if you're going to take on an adult dog, whether it's a rehome or a rescue, you really need somewhere ultra secure. I mean, a roofed enclosure that can't be dug out of for at least at least a week, at least. Uh, and that would be a, you know, um, a dog that's not been abused, that is very resilient. He might be fine to let him out then in a securely fenced area, of course, um, after a week or so. Some can take a lot longer. Um, but that secure containment until, because they've no bond with you, they just met you. They're not going to come back if they get out. That's right. Um, so why are they not claimed? Often they're unchipped, so really convenient for people to abandon them in rural areas. Uh, maybe the neighbours have been complaining about the barking, quite common, because barking can carry across valleys, you know, it can carry a long distance. So um, we do have a problem with that in the, some of the rural areas. Uh, the owners don't have the resources. They don't have the time, the structure or the knowledge to train or care for them. Uh, they might be frightened by them. They fell in love with a cute white fluffy puppy that turned into a Tyrannosaurus rex and loss of their livestock or their farm. They just have to move quickly through these. Why are they difficult to recapture and what is required? 
So if they're unsocialized, unhandled or fright frightened, it's going to become extremely difficult to recapture them. They should never be approached by members of the public, which may make it worse, and it has made it worse in some cases. A well-socialised dog may approach you. And we've had good success with some of our Marama rescue groups uh, working in, in com combination with Millie's Trap and Rescue, I think. Uh, they've had great success in anchoring and trapping these dogs. And re recapture can take weeks. It'll take months or it may never happen if you don't have this expert input. So please reach out. What's the best placement for them? So a rural acreage home with an experienced LGD owner who's committed to that dog's needs is the most successful. Owners who've done their research. Uh, novice owners in suburbia are the least successful. Suburban livestock guardian dogs can be successfully repurposed, as I mentioned previously. Unfortunately, in the USA, they have a policy when they're in shelters and rescues that they don't rehome them to working situations. And that's the biggest mistake over there. And that's why these dogs just go round and round and round on the rehoming circuit, because they're not putting them in the right environment. So how you can help? You can help us by sharing this information, reaching out for professional assistance from those experienced with these breeds when you need it, and avoiding some public opinions that popular opinions that aren't really correct, such as they're stubborn, vicious, just throw them in the paddock, etc. It doesn't work. Here is Robin Jay's contact details if anybody wants them. Uh, they'll be on the slides, of course, on the recording if you want to just take that down very quickly. And I'm happy to help out with more than just, you know, surrendered dogs. I do do a lot of training support and try and work with owners to keep the dog in the home it's already in. Yeah, brilliant. Robin is so, such a valuable resource. So just to recap, have a compassionate approach to them, soft voice, careful handling. Try to see if you can get someone who's consistent with them and they can then trust in your environments. And a quick exit into those experienced hands uh, will be very beneficial. Mm. Uh, and there's my contact details, of course. Robin, thanks so much for your contribution with that. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it, Erin. Yeah, we've got questions now, Thank I think. Thank you both. Yes. Sorry I mean, it was so uh, long. It was quite a lot. No, there's a hell of a lot to say and uh, it was incredibly interesting um, I've definitely got some questions. <laughs> I, I can't see any in the Q&A at the moment, but I, I'm just going to kick things off. So I think essentially what I'm hearing um, you say, Erin, is that from a um, shelter or pound, you know, in care sort of perspective, um, really everything that you've said, the basics are, no dog to dog meat, which is often a, you know, a requirement as part of our, you know, behaviour assessments. <laughs> um, to house them in a quieter area, and to use different um, human behaviour, be much more aware than perhaps the the shelter workers are with, you know, every other dog in kennels. Um, although I have to say that everything that you have said that applies to LGDs really applies to all dogs. Absolutely. We just don't do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and don't expect them to conform. If if those um, organisations are doing behaviour assessments, and I always say that in air quotes, um, then don't with, with LGDs. Would that be correct? Have I summarised yeah. that correctly? So the two points, and I'll bring Robin in as well. In the first one, you can do a dog-to-dog -dog assessment, but don't do it in the time space that you would for a normal breed. Yeah. Give them more time and assess that dog as to its level of socialisation. So as opposed to normal breeds who are going to be more socialised probably, these ones you're going to have lots of pockets that aren't socialised. So that could put them at a disadvantage when it's too early. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or it may be yeah. that that's a, a pure working dog. It's not going to have a lot of socialisation. So that's the difference in the yep. approach and that's why you'd reach out to us to just give you a bit of guidance with that and i forgot mm. what the last one was what was that last one you mentioned uh, about 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 the uh, behavior assessments yeah so reach out to your rescues or to me and we can help you with that mm. um just mm. you know we've just got a better understanding of what else might be going on 
And a positive yeah. reinforcement trainer will go looking for the cause. They just don't mm. accept what is manifesting. And that's the beauty mm. of positive reinforcement. We go looking for the cause and we address the cause rather than just put a Band-Aid on the, on the thing. So, Robin, did you have anything to say? Um, I, th I think it's fairly well known that these guys consistently do poorly in behavioural assessments in a pound situation. The smiling, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if we touched on that, but that tends no, to get them, it does tend to get them into quite a bit of difficulty because a lot of pound workers and shelter workers either don't know or don't understand that it's a submissive gesture. It's not aggression, but it can look absolutely dreadful. Like they will peel their lips right mm -hmm. back and it's for all the world like a massive snarl. Um, also, mm. to, you can't really assess them on familiar ground for them because they can get guardy about it. So it really does need to be somewhere yeah. neutral. And for everyone's safety, you want to have those physical barriers in place if you're testing with other dogs, strangers or other pets, particularly your, your little pocket mm. pets. Yeah. Perfect. And so really the key is to get them out of that facility type situation as quickly as possible. What yeah. sort of foster home would you, um, I mean, obviously experienced LGD foster homes are not, you know, on every corner or on every right. organisation's foster list. So yep. if they weren't already um, experienced, what would you say uh, would make a good foster home for an LGD? To get, the best, to get the most accurate assessment, you need somewhere where you can hopefully um, make that decompression period shorter for the dog because the sooner he decompresses and is starting to offer a little trust and, and a little come toward you and meet you halfway type thing, then you can get a better mm -hmm. handle of what that dog's actually like when he's not shut down and just totally wary of everything around him. So uh, yep. rural foster homes are going to always be more successful in that regard because it's right. going to be that low, lesser stimulus environment, which would hopefully, the, well, the aim is to just get you there that little bit quicker and you can then better assess where that dog's going to fit best. And so no other animals in the foster home would you recommend um, or just uh, in a managed no, environment? Really with these guys, people who are interested in these dogs and are offering their time up for fostering, chances are they will be a multiple animal household. Um, it just yeah. goes with the territory. They will probably have livestock. They more than likely have other dogs. The upside of that is they will usually have secure enclosures where they can contain this yeah. dog. Um, I don't yeah. let a new rescue interact physically, like directly with any of my critters for at least that first 24, 48 hours then they're calmer mm. and we take it as the dog says that he's ready to, to make the next step. Okay. Yep. And we've got a question from Tyler here. How would you start to gain experience with these types of dogs? That's an awesome question. Um, there, any livestock guardian rescue organisation are always desperate for volunteers, foster workers, anything like that, um, a lot mm. of them will welcome you with open arms if you're in a situation that you want to learn, whether it's hands-on or whether you want to make phone contact or whichever. We're, we're happy to share the love and um, mm. help more people get that knowledge because that's in the dog's best interest. Okay, cool. And where would we find a list of um, LGD rescues around Australia? Um, where can people look? Um, sorry, you there go, Erin? No, the, well, there, there isn't anything formally listed, but um, Robin would be your best place to start. She would, you know, you know, most of them. Is Marama yeah. Rescue Victoria, yeah. who's been around for a long time. Long she's time. very experienced, but she's very full. So they're all, they're either shut or they're, have closed their books because there's an overwhelm. But Robin yeah. will know most of them. So get in touch with Robin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And there are some groups that aren't really rescuing dogs as such, but they are trying to offer support and resources so that people can work with their dog and work through whatever issue it is that's making them want to rehome. Um, oh, excellent. We are seeing, though, um, a, a bit of the impacts of the housing crisis and there's not much mm. we can in the way of support and training around that because it's just circumstance. Yeah what it is you know yeah no that's right 
Uh, we've got a question from Michaela. Can they work well on farms with other breeds like Collies or I suppose Kelby's other Absolutely. working working dogs mm. if they're raised together? Absolutely. And sometimes they don't have to be raised together. So a good okay. livestock a good livestock guardian dog will respect the work that a herding dog does. So often mm. when you see, particularly in Europe, you'll see these dogs with herding dogs as well. So the livestock guardian dog should should not be upset about the herding dog so long as the herding dog is not stressing the livestock. So if you've yeah. got a herding dog that's pushing, that's biting, that's hurting the livestock, your livestock guardian dog is not going to allow that to happen. So you just yeah. be aware of that. And just look, you could put the livestock guardian dog on a lead whilst you're introducing your working dog and letting yeah. your working dog work and helping your livestock guardian dog to accept them. So often yeah. LGDs need you to show them what's acceptable mm -hmm. and what's what not, particularly is. in new yeah. things. So that's one way you could do it. I don't know, Robin, if you had anything else to say. Um, honestly, it, that would come down to really good management around both of Absolutely. those dogs. Being yeah. careful about introductions, the stress from the, um, the dogs on the sheep or goats. If your goat starts vocalising that he's mm. distressed, frightened your lgd is absolutely going to step in so right. it's management until you feel that those dogs that those individual dogs have a good relationship yeah perfect. okay and a question from eve um do lgds recognize or understand other lgds and their behavior etc better than you know the other breeds uh, in, what, in or other breed groups, in terms of what when they're in suburbia well, for, or working situations, or it, well, I I'm not sure what what Erin is um specifically referring to, but I think for mm. any situation, I always find it interesting if you go to, you know, a, an area where there's lots of different dogs, you'll find the border collies off doing their border collie thing, you'll find the labradors off doing their right. labrador thing, you know, and they seem to get each other. Um, yeah. Is it the same with LGGs? Do they sort of see each other and and um, understand each other's behaviours more intuitively, I guess, than other breed types? Are you are you going to jump in there, Robin? Or but I've I, got something to say I, as well. I think they do, and they can. It's not a obviously there's no guarantees, but yeah. um, I do think if you watch an LGD move amongst his flock of sheep or goats, he mm. can make his behaviour very unobtrusive. He lowers his head. He makes no eye contact. And when they're meeting um, another, I've just with my own dogs and new rescues mm. coming in, they tend to be quite accepting. Whereas yeah. if a random stray dog ran down my driveway, yeah. my dog would be straight on it. So they do yeah. recognise that body language. Mm. Um, yeah. I feel, but that's yeah. purely my opinion. That's yes. a great point about, you know, they're exhibiting the right body language because they know <laughs> to yeah. the other livestock guardian dog. You know, lots of livestock guardian dogs, when they're at shows and things like that, they're fine. You shouldn't have an issue unless you're introducing an, an any new dog onto an existing property. So mm -hmm. that, that incumbent yeah. dog is going to take an exception and that's when you would need to go very, very slow and manage it, as Robin said. Mm, okay. I hope that helps, Michaela. Um, and I had another question. What is anchoring and trapping? Ah, go ahead, Robin. Um, anchoring is when uh, normally these guys, when they get lost, they'll be spotted. Yep. Um, yes. you know, by the public or the property owner or whatever. Anchoring yeah. is about um, preventing the dog from roaming any further and encouraging right. him to hang about in that general vicinity. Okay. The idea is that once he's turning up at a, at a usual spot every day for a feed and a drink of water and that sort of thing, then you can trap mm -hmm. him. Gotcha. If he's, yeah. When they're roaming, they can roam over, you know, yeah. and quite a large number of kilometres radius makes it very difficult to know where to put the trap. Yes, it and is the, interesting. Um, I mean, I think all community Facebook pages and lost and found pages, there's always posts about recently, you know, relocated LGDs that have got out, as you said, and it's a bit like, um, you know, those dogs that come off a puppy farm or something like that, they will often disappear within the sort of first 24 hours as well. And it's a similar type of thing, isn't it? It's just like, oh, my God, this is a completely different environment. 
I'm out and they're very yeah. difficult to to catch. So, I mean, you guys have offered us um, a raft of resources and some contact tax, which is really important um, and appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, just Got another question. Up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, how would they react if livestock begin fighting between each other? Do LGEs oh. see, that, see that as yeah. stressful? And do they want yeah. to intervene? So I don't know if you've heard about this particular behaviour. It's called splitting. So a dog, yes. a confident dog will split and it doesn't have to be its own livestock. I've seen a pit bull terrier on video split two cockerels fighting each other, right? Yep. And he just yep. charged in there. Oh, you've probably seen it. It's like, what are you guys up to? And you see the cockerels yeah. just move away. So that's yeah. called splitting behaviour. If that's mm. necessary, they'll do it. For example, if you've got head, rams headbutting, but you wouldn't have two rams in a paddock anyway. But mm. they do have that ability to do that. Um they will intervene in some cases um, because they want to keep the flock and the herd quiet and calm. Yeah. But, yeah. Robin, you pop in because you had something to say. Well, the way goats are, are managed, your, your bucks do tend to live together. Outside of breeding season, they do live together in a, a communal male group, like a bachelor mm -hmm. herd. If you like. mm -hmm. So there's going to be ructions and disagreements within that group. Uh, it, it, it can be very dependent on the dog and they do form yep. different levels of attachment to individuals. He will have his favourite animals. Um, right. and he will not be happy if another buck is bullying his favourite. <laughs> they do tend to intervene. I had a very small Marema bitch who would intervene between these massive big bucks and would not tolerate any fighting whatsoever between the boys if she was highly unamused. So they right. can... Again, no guarantees. Yeah, amazing. Well, look, it's 10 past one. Um, thank you so much, both of you. You've been incredibly generous with your time and your knowledge, and this has been a really wonderful session. Uh, I think everyone has enjoyed it. Um, so, everybody, thank you for your attendance today and make sure that you've signed up for our e-news and that we're connected on social media so that you get the announcements about future webinars and other things that are happening. And feel free to send us through suggestions for topics or presenters that you'd like to see featured. Uh, so thank you again, ladies. We really appreciate it. Um, take care, everybody, and we will see you at the next one. Thanks so much. Thanks so awesome. much, everyone. Thank Take care. Bye-bye.